traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you are doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. In today's show, I'll give you some homestead updates. We are going to talk about garde manger and food preparation and preservation. And the recipe is going to be making homemade butter. That's also food preservation. All right, so homestead updates. Uh, We like to keep a close eye on the sheep when lambs are about to be born. And like goat kids, lambs are very fragile for the first week or so. And after that, they go and grow like gangbusters. Um, But in preparation for the birth we're expecting next month, we brought the sheep up close for monitoring. They are now in a paddock right outside my window. It's my favorite time of year to look out the window to see them. I don't know about that. I really like looking out my living room window every day. Scott built the room and it is an awesome testament to his grasp of aesthetics. All times of the year, it is, it's so wonderful um, just to have the opportunity to look out those windows out across the pond and across the pastures. In the fall, the the leaves are great. Anyway, yesterday was another day of of, uh, goat chasing. A tree fell on the fence, and that's the perfect opportunity they were looking for in order to venture outside their normal boundaries. A simple scamper up the tree and over the fence. Just another day where our plans were altered for a couple of hours, a day in the life. Get used to it if you're going to have goats. We are also closely watching for the first calf. The calendar says it could be within the week. Uh, None of the cows, however, appear to be going along with that plan in this moment. Who knows? It could change tomorrow. Mostly we're looking for udders to start filling up. Now that can happen days, weeks, or even a month ahead of the birth. Or it may be that her udder doubles in size overnight and bam, birth the next day. You just never know. We keep our eyes on them and eagerly anticipate the new arrivals. The weather is finally providing a better environment for Scott to get those creamery walls up. And I look out my dining room window and I, and see the walls rising on the creamery. It's a beautiful sight. I am so excited about making cheese again soon when those calves are born. And I'm eagerly anticipating when I can actually make cheese in the new creamery. All right, today I'm going to bring you some great information about how traditional roles can change and evolve over time according to the needs and circumstances of the day as history goes along. And the term we're going to explore is garde manger. Uh, Let me spell that for you. G-A-R-D-E-M-A-N-G-E-R. A French word. And it means keeper of the food. Garde manger, keeper of the food, is both a person or people, today it's people, and a place. Today it's more people. It used to be a place. The word, uh, again, in French is translated keeper of the food. Keeper of the food. As a physical place, it's a cool, well-ventilated area where Uh, Cold dishes such as salads, hors d'oeuvres, appetizers, canapes, pâtés, and terrines are prepared. Uh, So you're storing and preparing in this area. And other, so you, you may have other foods that are refrigerated there. A person in charge of this area as, uh, is known as the chef garde manger or the pantry chef. 
Now today, you have like really large hotels uh, and restaurants and catering services. Um, they may have garde manger staff to perform additional duties, such as creating decorative elements uh, of a buffet. Uh, presentation, ice carvings, edible centerpieces that are made from cheese, fruit and vegetable carvings, or even butter or towel. Towel. Tallow. Tallow. That's rendered beef fat. But, um, so how did we get to this point? This is, I'm talking about, this is today, but where did the whole term garde manger start? So before the invention of refrigeration, garde manger, literally keeper of the food to be eaten, was a place for preserving and storing food until it was needed in the kitchen. And the storage room or pantry then became the convenient workspace for preparation of an array of, for an, of an array of cold foods. So you're working with cold foods. You want to work in that cool area to keep the food cool. Um, so, and 200 and, 30 years ago, in pre-revolutionary France, preservation, storage, and maintenance of a large supply of food and beverages was an outward symbol of power, wealth, a status symbol. So it was this duty of supervising the preserving of the food and managing its utilization that expanded the use of the term to include the person or people. So first it was just the cool place even before refrigeration you found a cool place um, and then it, the um, actual preservation storage and maintenance in in the larger households uh, developed the term to include the people that were actually doing the job now today the garde manger goes far beyond a cool storage facility it may be an entire department in a large hotel or a fine restaurant or, or very large catering outfit. Um, these garde manger staff members focus on the preparation and creative presentation of cold food items, um, including appetizers, salads, smoked meat, and cheeses. You have terrines. That's a, a meat fish or a vegetable mixture that's cooked and cooled in, into a loaf-type container, and then it can be sliced. You can have pâtés. Um, that's going to be, again, a paste of higher loaf. It's going to contain a liver. And then galantines, that is a, it's a cooked white meat or uh, fish. And it's boned and pressed again into a, into a shape. And then it's served cold in aspic. And aspic is, is like a gelatin that's made from uh, clarified meat stock. So when you're making it, or sometimes called consomme when it's clarified. But when you have that meat stock and when you cool it, it gels. And so that's what is used in the aspic. So today's garde manger chefs earned their place in this long tradition throughout history through meticulous work and artistic in expression. And I'm going to include images of these dishes on the website so you can put the name with the food. Uh, all right, so let me, let me go back even farther and give you a little bit more of a timeline and expand this a little bit more. Because uh, I'm kind of talking about where, where we are today with it, with these elaborate uh, presentations. Um, so here's a brief idea of the timeline. So you've got maybe 3000 BC Sumerians beginning to salt, use salt to preserve meat. And then fast forward 4000 years and you begin in the 1100, you begin to get cold food storage <clears throat> and preparation. And that became common. And then in the late 1500s, um, charcuterie guilds oversaw the preservation and sales of pork products. And I'll expand on that in a little bit more. I'm just kind of going really quickly through here first. And then you had the abolishment of the guild following the French Revolution. And the, the, the guild and garde manger household staff are then going to restaurants and hotels for work. And that changes that face of that. And uh, so let me, let's, let's look at this in greater detail. So the garde manger's original purpose to preserve food, that's been a concern since prehistory. 
hunters and gatherers first faced the challenge of keeping food for later use, and they likely just stumbled on ways to do that. They're finding brine-coated fish drying in the sun by the sea or uh, hanging meat by the fire to keep it away from animals, and then later they notice its dry texture and they're enjoying smoky flavor. And uh, Sumerians appear to have been the first to salt meat in order to preserve it. I'm going to talk about these methods of preservation uh, that I just went over a little bit later. Later, the Chinese, Greeks, and Romans salted fish and other foods. And then you had cured pork, such as bacon and ham, uh, prepared in the Roman province of Gaul that is now France. And it was served to the connoisseurs in Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. And uh, so very quickly you had this beginning to turn into more of an art form than just storing food. And by the Middle Ages, uh, peasant farmers had developed many ways to preserve meat after they slaughtered their livestock in the fall. So they salted, they pickled, they dried, and they smoked meats. And then those filled the storerooms of the nobility. You had all the peasants working for the nobility back then. And uh, the term garbanger made its appearance with the arrival of special chambers for keeping all of that food stored. And a variety of food items common to uh, are common in the garbanger of noble households eventually found their way into medieval markets, where individual guilds or merchant groups began to oversee uh, their preparation and the trade. And the guild known as charcuterie, for instance, prepared and sold pork products, including uh, pate, bacon, ham, and sausage. And the guilds exercised enormous power over commerce in food and other, other goods until the late 18th century. So as these different needs arose, the storage, the availability, who, who was performing the tasks has evolved over time. So until the late 18th century, they, the guilds were abolished. And by then, you had many noble households had also dissolved. The aristocracy was in decline. So then you have former guild members and garbage staff. They, they had to have jobs. So they found work in hotels and restaurants that had begun to develop and those developed out of traditional inns and taverns. So you have an evolution going on there. So what happened over the years is gradually a kitchen hierarchy emerged in which you have different workers that had distinct responsibilities or areas of specialization. In the late 19th, 19th century, Auguste Escoffier, a French chef, a restaurateur, a culinary writer, um, he popularized and updated traditional French cooking methods. And then he organized kitchen procedures and staff into what is now known as the brigade system. The garmanger or cold foods chef was among the primary figures in the classic brigade. Um, now, early on in the craft, a person working the the garbage station at a restaurant was limited to the preparation of salads and preserved and cold foods. Today, the garbage profession has a much broader scope. In addition to traditional items, sausages, pâtés, and cheeses, the brigade is often, and I'm talking about uh, the garbage brigade, is often responsible for the preparation of salads, cold sauces or dressings, sandwiches, hot and cold hors d'oeuvres, um, and appetizers. And uh, these foods that are prepared by uh, Garbanger appear at banquets and buffets and receptions and formal and informal parties. And the presentation of these foods often includes elaborate centerpieces and artistically designed platters. We've come a long way from simple food preservation, cold storage, and uh, preservation and management. And it all comes under that same term that has evolved over the years. Now, let's let's go even further. To perform these duties, the classic garbage station 
has its own brigade in a really large operation. You have the chef garde supervising the operation and overseeing the various other positions. So examples of other positions that might be supervising, you would have um, a, someone who's butchering all of the meats and poultry. You'd have maybe responsibility for cleaning, preparing, and storing fish, shellfish, creating fish sauces. You'd have someone that was maintaining the buffet. And charcutiers make all of the sausage and smoked items. And you would also have apprentices. So you've got this whole uh, number of people that work in this brigade that is the uh, Garde Manger Brigade, which is only one of other areas that would be part of that restaurant. Now, let's focus on the beginnings, the food preservations. That, that's how it all started. And we again, we've come a long way from that. Um, but it all started with food preservation. Now you may be already using one or more of the techniques that I'm going to talk about. Maybe you're preparing yourself for the task. Um, that makes you a garde manger or at the very least an apprentice keeper of the food. Um, we're going to talk about curing, smoking, drying, preserving in fat, and I'm going to include cheese making, uh, cheese making is its own field. I've, I'm included it here as a method of food preservation, though the Garde Manger Brigade member utilizing cheese would probably be working a different station. Uh, using all sorts of cheese would be central, but creating fresh cheeses, that would be all that they would actually make. Uh, and then they would leave the preservation of milk via aged cheeses to other professionals cheesemakers that would be the standard they would get ready-made cheeses except for fresh cheeses all right food preservation um it's been central to the garbage from its beginnings preservation techniques used in the garbage today have exponentially surpassed their original purpose which was to keep food safe for later consumption today Preservation techniques also create new flavors and textures for meats and other foods. Uh, so we've learned a lot. The main preserving methods of the garde manger are curing, smoking, drying, and preserving in fat. Let's talk about curing first. To cure a food, you're either going to dry it in a granular salt, which is a dry cure, or you're going to immerse it in a salt solution, which would be a wet cure or a brine. So to use a dry cure, cure it's pretty simple you just rub the mixture over the surface of the food you put the food in the container wrap it up in a cheesecloth or paper you're, you're going to pack all of all of the the dry cure which is primarily salt you're going to wrap all that together and then you're going to refrigerate it for whatever the required length of time is that's going to vary and then you're going to turn it regularly to keep it uh, evenly coated and if it's a really large item, it, it might require some additional rubbing uh, during the curing, you know, rub that salt deeper into there. Uh, but after the curing is done, you're going to wash the, the food and get uh, the, you're going to get the uh, curing mixture off of it. And then you're, you're going to either cook that item or allow it to mature by drying, aging or smoking. All right. So we've got curing that's also maybe going to go into drying or smoking, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Prosciutto is uh, an example of a meat preserved with a dry cure. Um, the usual procedure there is to cure the ham for approximately four weeks and then hang it to air dry. Right, So you've got that combination of curing and drying. And it's an Italian dry cured ham that is you know, usually uh, thin sliced and served uncooked. Now a wet cure or a brine it's just a dry cure that's dissolved in water. And uh, brines usually contain sea salt or some kind of salt, a sweetener, spices, and herbs. And uh, to make a, a brine, you're going to combine the mix with the water and bring it to a boil. And then after the solution is cooled, then you put the, your food in it and you refrigerate it and soak it for the required time. And you, you want the brine to completely cover your food, just the same way that you did with the dry, where it was completely covered in that salt. You want it completely... Um, covered in the liquid brine 
Again, browning times are going to vary, but then after you're done with it, you're going to rinse the, the food and then you're either going to cook it by boiling it, poaching it, or baking it. And, uh, or you could allow it to continue to mature by drying or smoking it. Now, common examples of brined meats include bacon, brisket, corned beef, and pastrami. So those are cures. You're basically using salt there. Now, smoking, it, we're going to use wood. So originally a means of uh, preserving food, smoking is actually popular today for the unique flavors that it imparts to a variety of foods. So again, it starts off, it's just a way to preserve food, but then you learn how to be creative with it. Um, the main chemical components of smoke, tar, creosote, alcohol, and formaldehyde, they supply both flavor and small quantities of, of preserving agents. Um, the best woods for smoking are going to be low in resin. Resin is going to make the food bitter. And uh, some of the commonly used woods are going to include hickory, cherry, apple, maple, oak, mesquite, and alder. Smoking alone is not enough to preserve food. Pre-treat food to be smoked with a dry cure or brine to ensure a longer shelf life. After the curing, air dry the, the, pro, the food and then rub it with oil to prevent a crust from forming during the smoking process. All right, so you're doing either a dry cure or a wet cure and then you air dry it and rub it with some oil. And then the process of smoking depends on the method used. And the, there's four methods of smoking. You got cold, hot, a pan smoke, and a liquid smoke. So cold smoking, also known as slow smoking, is the best and only true method according to the definition of smoking. Um, the cold process imparts flavor, but it does not cook the food. And it must be either cured before cold smoking or cooked after it's cold smoked. So temperatures for cold smoking are going to be down in the range of 50 degrees to 95 degrees. So there's no cooking happening there. Now hot smoking or fast smoking, it cooks and smokes the food product at the same time. Um, so that's going to require a temperature above 140 degrees. So then there's pan smoking, which is also a hot smoking method. Um, it's going to occur also at temperatures above 140 um, Sometimes it's called roast smoking, and it you're smoking food in a covered pan. You line the bottom of the pan with wood chips, place it on a burner on high heat, and when the wood begins to smoke, put the fo food in the pan on a roasting rack, and then cover the edges of the pan really well. Cover and seal that pan really well, and you're going to turn your heat down a little bit and then you're smoking the food to your desired doneness. The recipe is going to be what, seven to 15 minutes, something like that. And then there's liquid smoking. Um, this method gives food a smoky flavor without subjecting it to actual smoke uh, or the smoking process. So it involves the use of a liquid with a smoke flavor. And that's made by rubbing resin, which builds up on the walls of the smokehouse or the chimney with a liquid. And then you rub the smoky flavored liquid into the scored skin or into the flesh of the food. And then you allow it to marinate for a few hours. And you'll get that smoky flavor in there. So it's not actually smoked. You're just getting smoke flavor. Now let's move on to drying. We've talked about curing in salt. We talked about smoking, but we can also dry food. Um, and that can be an important step before and after smoking. You might dry it and then smoke it. You might smoke it and then dry it. It could also completely replace smoking as a stage in preserving food items. So you're going to go from your salt curing straight to drying. Now, certain foods can take weeks or even months to air dry. Um, and a lengthy air drying period is the final step in the preparation of various cured and, and cold smoked hams. The process for beef jerky and, and other Italian and German beef sausage products includes air drying. So uh, let's talk about preserving in fat. There are confits and roulettes. Those are the two classic methods of, of 
food preservation using fat as the preservative. And the meat keeps for several weeks under refrigeration. So it's not as long term as some of the others, but it works pretty good. Con, uh, confit is meat cooked and preserved in its own fat. Uh, the meat's usually poultry, especially a duck or goose that often happens, or a small game, a rabbit. Um, so to make a confit, you're simmering the cured bird or animal parts, again, cured first, um, and, and you're simmering them in the rendered fat. Preferably, you're going to use the fat of the same bird or the animal, but sometimes you need more, so you're going to add some other fat. But after cooking the pieces, you pack them in a crock and cover them with the fat. And the fat seals out the air. It keeps the meat from spoiling. Uh, roulette is also preserved meat. And to prepare a roulette, you're slowly cooking the meat. Again, pork or poultry. Again, duck or goose. And you're cooking it in broth or fat with vegetables and seasonings. And then um, after cooking the meat, then you're going to mash it and mix it with some of the cooking fat. And then you're going to pack it into a mold, sealing it with the rendered fat. And like um, like the confits, roulettes will keep for several weeks under refrigerate, refrigeration. So the roulettes are usually served cold as a spread for bread or toast. And confits are, are generally served hot. Let me talk about cheese making. Cheese making is also a form of food preservation. Um Cheese is made by curdling the proteins in milk, either with a live culture or with a mild acid. And then you're squeezing out most of the water, leaving only the fat and the protein. And thus, fresh milk, which is itself highly perishable, is transformed into a product uh, that, bec it, because it's low in moisture, it can be stored for months and years in a cool cellar or cave. All right, that's it for... Garbanger food preservation. On to the recipe of the day. What a coincidence. It's going to be yet another way to preserve food. We're going to talk about homemade butter. Now, people have been making butter for centuries. Um, it, we initially used butter as a way of preserving the fat in the milk. Butter rose to prominence as a spread and a cooking fat in northern Europe during the Middle Ages when it was eaten by peasants. Um... The upper classes also ate it periodically uh, because it was the only animal of flat, of fat allowed by Rome on days when meat was forbidden. In the 16th century, it was allowed during Lent. So eat your butter. Today's the day. Um, in the early days, it took a little while to get enough cream to churn, and so it was collected over various days. And because the milk in these small old-timey dairies it was not refrigerated, the lactic acid bacteria inherent in dairy would ferment slightly. This is the cultured butter, and it has a very tangy and rich flavor. Most butters made in Europe still taste this way, although today they're, they're made from pasteurized cream inoculated with lactic acid. Now, uncultured butter made from straight-up pasteurized cream, no lactic acid, is called sweet cream butter, and it's what we're used to in the U.S. And uh, at its very essence, making butter requires nothing more than agitation. What you're doing is separating the fat from the milk. You can use a blender, a stand mixer with the whip attachment, or you can just shake it by hand in a, a mason jar. And for those who desire to dedicate themselves to making it regularly, you might invest in a butter churn. I have both a hand butter churn and an electric butter churn. Um, if you use a stand mixer, be sure to place a kitchen towel over the mixer and the bowl to stop the butter, buttermilk from flinging all over your kitchen. Because um, what will happen is when the butter globules form, the buttermilk becomes thin, really thin, like water at that point, And it can really splash a lot. All right, how to make homemade butter. What you need. You need a pint of heavy whipping cream. You need some ice water. You need salt if you're going to have salted butter. And you need a stand mixer with a whip attachment, a blender, or a jar with a tight-fitting lid. Or your butter churn. So what are you going to do? You're going to set a pint of heavy cream out to warm to room temperature about two hours. Then you're going to... Uh, 
pour the cream into your device or into a jar with a tight fitting lid. Um, if you're using machine, turn on low speed, then raise to medium speed. If you're using a jar, just start shaking. You're going to need some serious elbow grease if you're doing it by hand. Now first the cream is going to turn into whipped cream with soft and then stiff peaks. Keep going until the cream breaks. You may have seen this when you were making whipped cream. You might have accidentally made butter or began to make butter. If you're shaking the cream by hand, you'll hear a, a sloshing and then you'll begin to feel something more solid hit the sides of the jar. If you're using a stand mixer, uh, you'll see the butter clinging to the beater. This usually takes anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes or even 20 minutes with an electric butter churn. It's a little gentler. Um, churning by hand, probably going to take a little longer. In this process, you're separating the butter fat from the liquid. Now once the butter has solidified, pour off the buttermilk and save it for baking or you can drink it. It's like skim milk. Scoop the butter into the, a bowl. So you're separating the buttermilk from the butter and then you're going to rinse the butter by pouring ice water over it and then you're and you're pressing the remaining buttermilk out. Use a small spatula or a spoon. You're pouring the water over it. Keep repeating that, pressing the water through the butter. You want to keep rinsing and squishing the butter with the ice water until the water runs clear. And then at that point, you can add some salt if you like, then work that through the butter, just kind of folding it over and over and over into the butter. And there you have it. You got old fashioned butter, churn optional. You can put it on your pancakes, or biscuits, your toast, corn on the cob, a baked potato, or whatever you like. Enjoy. A couple of notes. Butter freezes really well, uh, so make a lot and store it. Um, and what makes butter yellow? Anybody know? It is the beta carotene that creates the yellow in cow milk. And butter made from our Normandy cow's milk is an even deeper yellow than butter from the grocery store. Um, the reason is a combination of the richness of our Normandy cow's cream and their 100% pasture-based diet. All right, final thoughts. We're ready for spring here at the homestead. Uh, I bet you are too. We're prepped and ready. Um, I'm sure spring will bring more goat escape story, stories to share. Uh, seems like they come nearly every week. Uh, expect that if you choose to raise goats. I hope the history of food preservation and presentation was entertaining and educational for you. Perhaps I've inspired you to investigate uh, a new garbage food preservation technique. Uh, you too can be a keeper of the food. Let me know how it goes for you. What did you try? Leave a comment on the website. Sign up for the monthly newsletter. Each month you'll get cheesy food news I've consumed as well as a convenient clickable list of uh, podcasts and recipes that I'm publishing here. Uh, speaking of recipes, don't forget to try that traditional butter making recipe. If you're able to purchase raw milk from a local farmer, you have the advantage of skimming that cream off and making your own butter with it. How cool is that? Find even more recipes available for download at www.peacefulheartfarm.com. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.